Hi everyone, welcome back to this video series on symmetry groups. We've recently moved from looking at symmetries of the Euclidean plane to looking at symmetries of the sphere, and we've already seen that there are very many differences in the geometry of the sphere than in the geometry of the plane. To name a few examples, angles in a triangle don't add up to 180 degrees anymore. Rotations and translations now correspond to the same symmetry, and the regular tilings are different. Now there exists a regular tiling with three pentagons around every point. That didn't exist in the Euclidean plane. In this video, we'll go one step further and look at an analogy to a famous theorem that we covered in one of the previous videos, Conway's magic theorem. The question we're going to answer is, what possible wallpaper patterns exist on the sphere? How can we catalog them? We'll see there's actually very many similarities between the theory of the plane and the theory of the sphere in this case. Then at the end of the video, we'll go through one of my favorite proofs in the whole of spherical geometry. What do angles in a triangle add up to? It seems we can get very many different numbers. Is there a pattern? Let's find out. So first we'll do what any sensible mathematician does when faced with a new problem. Look at an example. Let's look at one of the most famous examples of a spherical pattern, the football. As seen in the last videos, a tiling and a fundamental domain for this pattern is here. Just as in the Euclidean case, the fundamental domain is a tile such that every symmetry of the sphere maps the domain onto a different tile. Here we see that this is true. For example, this reflection maps the domain here, and this rotation maps the domain here. So, just as in the Euclidean case, every single tile in this tiling corresponds to a symmetry of the group. To find a system of generators for this group, Let's add symmetries until we can use just those symmetries to map the fundamental domain onto every single tile. For this case, we see that adding in just one reflection f is not enough, as we only get these two tiles. Adding another g is still not sufficient. If we add a third h, we now see we can indeed map the fundamental domain to every single tile. So the group is generated by three reflections, f, g, and h, and we can write the group like this. In Euclidean space, we distinguished between wallpaper patterns and non-wallpaper patterns by looking at the fundamental domain. We said that any pattern with an infinite fundamental domain was not suitable for wallpaper, and we noted that having a finite fundamental domain was equivalent to there being two independent translations. But infinite fundamental domains don't ever occur for the sphere, as the sphere itself is finite. So, remembering that rotations and translations are the same for a sphere, we'll say that a pattern on the sphere is a spherical wallpaper pattern if it has two independent rotations. David noted last time that if a pattern only has a single independent rotation, then the fundamental domain is a loon. And so this is an easy way to spot patterns that are not wallpaper patterns. Here's an example of a pattern which is not a wallpaper pattern. There are two different rotations, R, a rotation by 60 degrees, and S, a rotation by 120 degrees, for example, but one can be generated by the other. In this case, S equals R squared. Clearly, this is a fundamental domain, and it is a loon. On the other hand, our football pattern here has two different rotations, R and S, around different centres of rotation. So this is a spherical wallpaper pattern. Since it's a wallpaper pattern, we can try and classify it just as before using Conway's notation. Remember that to do this, we note down the features of the pattern, crossings of mirror lines with an asterisk and red numbers, centers of rotation with blue numbers, and glide reflections with a cross. Here, all of the symmetries are explained with reflections, and there are three distinct mirror intersections, here, here, and here. Since the number of mirrors at each is 5, 3, and 2 respectively, Conway's name for this group is asterisk 5, 3, 2. In lesson 2, we stated Conway's magic theorem, that the possible wallpaper groups in the plane are exactly those whose features cost precisely 2 in total, according to this table of costs. For example, asterisk 2, 2, 2, 2 and asterisk 6, 3, 2 were possible groups as if we add up the costs of these features, we get exactly two, as shown here. In the videos and exercises, we went through all the possibilities and found that there are exactly 17 different possible wallpaper symmetry groups in the plane. Now, notice for this new spherical wallpaper group, 
the cost of the group is not 2. If we add up the cost of these features for this group, we get 1 plus 24 over 60 plus 20 over 60 plus 15 over 60 is equal to 1 plus 59 over 60. This is not equal to 2, it's 1 over 60 short. We could say that 1 over 60 is the change from 2 that we get, as if we bought the group from a shop using two units of currency and got 1 60th of a unit back. So it seems the magic theorem doesn't work. Let's try another pattern and see what happens. Here we have reflectional and rotational symmetries. There is one distinct crossing of two mirror lines, here, and one distinct centre of rotation, here. This means that the name of this group is 3 asterisk 2. Note that this is a fundamental domain, and these symmetries can be used to map the fundamental domain to every single tile. What is the cost? Well, let's add up the values of the features. 2 thirds plus 1 plus 1 quarter is equal to 1 plus 11 over 12. So again, we don't quite get 2, and the change is 1 over 12. It may seem the cost is completely random in each case, but there are things to notice here. Firstly, note that the cost always seems to be less than 2. How much less? There is in fact a link between the cost and the number of tiles in the pattern. If you'd like to think about it, pause the video now and see if you can work it out. The answer is that the change we get back from 2 is precisely 2 over n, where n is the number of tiles in the pattern. So our magic theorem for spherical symmetry patterns is the total cost of a spherical symmetry group is 2 minus 2 over n, where n is the number of tiles in the pattern. For example, the football has exactly 120 tiles. Notice that each of the pentagons here has 10 tiles and there are 12 pentagons. And the change is 2 over 120, equal to 1 over 60. In this second example, there are 24 tiles and the change is 2 over 24. OK, so the next question is, of all the possible combinations of features that add up to less than 2, which ones correspond to a spherical wallpaper symmetry group? For example, what about the combination 2-3, corresponding to two centres of rotation of orders 2 and 3 respectively? Or just a single cross corresponding to a single glide reflection? This is a more difficult question to answer. Unlike in the case of the plane, where every combination of features adding up to 2 correspond to a wallpaper symmetry group, not all combinations of features costing less than 2 correspond to a spherical wallpaper group. To take an example, consider the group MM, which describes the symmetries of a pattern with two centres of rotation, each of order M. What does a pattern with this symmetry group look like? Though it may look like there would be two independent rotations, in fact, this group corresponds to patterns with only one rotational symmetry, because a single rotational symmetry on the sphere fixes two antipodal points, which are the two centres of rotation. Here is an example of a pattern with this symmetry group, with m equal to 6. Note that there are two centres of rotation, each corresponding to a rotation of order 6. Since there is only one symmetry here, it is not a spherical wallpaper pattern, and you can see that the fundamental domain is a loon. What about the combination mn, with m and n different? Actually, this combination of features can't occur at all. As before, the centres of rotation would have to be opposite one another and correspond to the same rotation, so the orders of rotation must be the same. In the exercises, you will also consider the group asterisk mn, and you'll see that this also does not correspond to a wallpaper symmetry group. We won't go over every single possible wallpaper symmetry group here, but in the exercises there are more for you to identify and label. In each case, you will see that the cost of the features can be deduced from the number of tiles in tiling with a fundamental group, and vice versa. It turns out, though, that every possible combination of features does occur as a wallpaper symmetry group, except for mn and asterisk mn with m and n different. As we've seen already, not every combination of features gives a spherical wallpaper pattern, as some won't have two independent rotations. As one final comment, this new magic theorem actually includes the old one for patterns in the plane. After all, for any wallpaper symmetry in the plane, there are infinitely many tiles. And so our new magic theorem tells us the cost of the features should be 2 minus 2 over infinity, which logic dictates should be just 2. 
To finish off this video, I wanted to share one of my favourite facts about spherical geometry. Though it is not strongly related to symmetries, there is still a link, which gives a glimpse into how spherical geometry and planar geometry differ in general. We saw above that the cost of features in a spherical wallpaper pattern is always strictly less than 2, unlike in the plane where it is always exactly 2. This should remind us of another fact that we've seen in this course. Angles in a spherical triangle add up to more than 180 degrees, unlike in the plane where they add up to exactly 180 degrees. So let's try and prove the Euclidean case first to remind ourselves of why this famous and ancient theorem is true. First, we'll prove that the external angles alpha, beta, and gamma add up to 360 degrees, and we'll then be able to deduce the fact about the internal angles. To see this, notice that if we walk around the triangle, then when we get back to where we started, we've turned exactly one full turn, 360 degrees. Therefore, alpha plus beta plus gamma equals 360 degrees. To see then what the sum of the internal angles is, Note that a plus alpha equals b plus beta equals c plus gamma equals 180 degrees, as we can see on this triangle. By adding all of these angles together, therefore, we get that a plus alpha plus b plus beta plus c plus gamma must be equal to 3 times 180, which is 540 degrees. And then we can subtract off alpha plus beta plus gamma, which is 360 degrees, to get a plus b plus c equals 180 degrees. All right, so what happens in the spherical case? Here is a spherical triangle. The best way to see what the sum of angles is, is to continue these straight lines, which as we've seen are all great circles, and cut the sphere exactly in half each. Now, consider this loom. What is its area? Well, the general formula for the surface area of a sphere is four pi r squared. We work with the unit sphere. So the area of the sphere is simply 4 pi. Now, this loon has an angle of a, which means the area of the loon is simply a fraction of a over 360 multiplied by the total surface area of the sphere, 4 pi. Similarly, this loon has an area of b over 360 times 4 pi, and this one has an area of c over 360 times 4 pi. Now, putting these three facts together, the clever thing to notice is the area of the sphere that isn't shaded is exactly the same as the area that is. This is because the triangle at the back is exactly the same as the one at the front, as are the three loons, which are cut out by exactly the same lines. Therefore, the red, green, and blue loons together cover half of the area of the sphere, 2 pi. However, this doesn't mean the areas of the three loons individually add up to 2 pi as this triangle in the centre gets counted three times. Instead, writing A for the area of the triangle, we have that the area of the red loon plus the area of the blue loon plus the area of the green loon minus the extra 2A from the triple counting of the central triangle is equal to 2 pi. Putting in our formulae for these areas, we get that a over 360 times 4 pi plus b over 360 times 4 pi plus c over 360 times 4 pi minus 2a is equal to 2 pi. Okay, so now we may rearrange this formula by just taking out the factor of a plus b plus c. So we get a plus b plus c multiplied by 4 pi over 360 is equal to 2 pi plus 2a. And now finally, we may divide by 4 pi over 360 to get a plus b plus c, the sum of the internal angles, is equal to 180 plus 360 over 2 pi times a. This formula is extremely cool. It really looks very similar to the formula for the Euclidean space, but with an extra bit involving the area of the triangle. So, if we know the area of the triangle, we know the sum of the angles. And if we know the sum of the angles, we know the area of the triangle. It seems a bit strange that just knowing information about the corners of a field on the sphere would tell you how much area there is in the field, don't you think? But that's what we just proved. This formula is even more beautiful if we write it in terms of the external angles. As before, 
a plus alpha equals 180, and the same is true of the other pairs. So replacing the a plus b plus c with 540 minus alpha minus beta minus gamma, we get the formula 540 minus alpha minus beta minus gamma is equal to 180 plus 360 over 2 pi times a. Then rearranging this to get it in terms of a plus alpha plus beta plus gamma, we get alpha plus beta plus gamma is equal to 360 minus 360 over 2 pi times a. And if we like, we can factor out the 360 here and get 360 open brackets 1 minus a over 2 pi. A couple of interesting points to think about. Firstly, as we shrink a triangle on the sphere very small, the ground it is drawn on becomes more and more flat, and the curvature of the sphere becomes less and less significant. We can see this in the formulae. As the area becomes smaller, these equations become more and more similar to the formulae for Euclidean space that we know so well. Finally, there is a similarity here to the magic theorem for spheres. We saw earlier that the total cost of features for a spherical wallpaper pattern is 2 minus 2 over n, where n is the number of tiles. But we can actually write this in terms of the area of a tile. Since the entire sphere has area 4 pi and the tiles are all the same size, it follows that the area of each tile a equals 4 pi divided by the total number of tiles n. And rearranging, n equals 4 pi divided by a. Therefore, the total cost is equal to 2 minus 2 over 4 pi over a, and simplifying this double fraction here, 2 minus a over 2 pi. Notice that this formula for the cost is remarkably similar to the formula for the sum of the external angles. How mysterious. There are many mysteries that there just aren't time here to wrap up, but hopefully you're now eager to research and explore them yourselves. One way that you can do this is by checking out the exercises linked in the description, where we can go back through all of the theorems that we've discovered in this video and put them into practice with some examples. To all those people who have stuck through with this video series right till the end, thanks very much. We hope you've enjoyed what you've seen, and let us know in the comments if there's anything you particularly liked or want to know more about. Actually, the series isn't quite over, because David will be giving you a couple of bonus videos on the hyperbolic plane, which is another non-Euclidean geometry. He'll be going through symmetries, angles in triangles, and all of this good stuff, in the case of the hyperbolic plane, as well as explaining what the hyperbolic plane really is and what it's about. Enjoy that, and goodbye for now.